And speaking of crowds, we all, I, I mentioned earlier on, I sort of gave you a compliment for being a human being and that we're all good at speaking. It's something we all do. But I have to admit that there are people who can make anything boring. That you could have a super exciting thing happen. You could, I don't know, you could be in a car accident or meet a famous person on the street who gives you $1,000 just because he, he liked you that day. Some amazing story. And then you go somewhere else and you're about to tell that story to other people and your friend starts telling the story and he totally blows it. He tells it in the most long-winded way. He starts talking about what he had for breakfast that morning and just rambling on and on. You're like, oh my God, because you were there and you know what happened. So it's possible, despite all of our natural instincts for communication, it is possible to make anything boring. Typically, typically by including too much. Typically, you, when you include too much, it makes things boring. If you, your goal is to be comprehensive, it makes things boring. Good stories are never comprehensive. Never, ever comprehensive. They have a narrative, they have a hook, they have some line of thinking that's interesting or piques your curiosity, and they run with that hook. So, the bad news is there are some people, and maybe some of you, I haven't had anything exciting happen yet with you in the room that I can tell how, you'll, how you would tell a story about it, but while it's possible that you can make anything boring, the counterpoint, which is good, is that it's also possible to make anything interesting. You can make anything interesting, and that's what good storytellers do. That's what good speakers do. That's what good salesmen do. They find a way to make the thing they're talking about interesting to you. And I have two tricks for this, two tricks that make it uh, easier to do. The, 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 the metaphor that works best is to think of a, a pitch where you're trying to convince someone of something or a, a meeting or a presentation, to think of it as a path. You, as the pitcher, as the presenter, you're trying to create a, a path that people can follow along on. They want to make it so they're interested all the way through. And the, the metaphor works best when you think about um, people are going to take the next step if they're interested. The word interesting is the, probably the best word when you're thinking about trying to keep, people, keep people's attention. And there are two easy ways to use that word to your advantage. Now, the first one is the easiest, but it's low-hanging fruit. It doesn't have a huge payoff. And that is, if ever you're trying to convince someone of something, you have something you want to talk about, some knowledge you want to share, you have to make sure you found an angle to talk about it that at least you're interested in personally. That you found a way to find meaning in whatever it is so it matters to you. All the research about communication and speaking and teaching, there's this factor that's entirely, I don't want to say superficial, but we put a lot of weight on people's enthusiasm. It makes a huge difference. People's retention, their ability to pay attention, their ability to learn and recall facts goes up when the person who gave those things to them was enthusiastic. So, how do you become enthusiastic? Well, you have to make sure whatever you're talking about, you found a way to think about it, however boring it might be, you found a way to think about it that at least is interesting to you. And the trick for this, one trick is to think about, instead of the technology that you're talking about, or the information you're talking about, which is kind of abstract and maybe kind of boring, but to think about the effect you want that information to have on the world that it can have an effect that you care about. And that's the passion that you need to make sure carries on through in whatever it is that you're talking about. Whether that's a line of code, whether that's some idea for a product or feature, think about the effect. It's much easier to get excited about effects and people and the effects your idea or that thing can have on people. So that's the easier one. The harder one, which is a higher payoff but requires more work, is to think about the people who are in the audience and why they're there. Many people, when they present, they give a lecture, or even when they teach a college course, they get wrapped up in themselves. Well, what, what do I want to talk about? Or how should I make this slide? Oh, this is a fun story to tell. And it becomes very selfish and egocentric, which, if you think about the world from a design or user experience perspective, is a fatal mistake. And instead, what you want to do is say, hey, why are these people coming? They have a thousand other things they could do. Why are they going to sit here and listen? What are the, thing, what are the questions they're likely to have? What did I put in the description that set them up? What, what expectations are they going to have? How do I take all the knowledge or wisdom or stories that I have and put that in a format that's interesting to the people who are coming? It does not take a whole lot of work to do this, especially if you're speaking somewhere where there's a host who's invited you in or it's a conference or a, it's an event of some kind. They have data about who, who shows up and why, how old they are, what degrees they have, what background they have, how many years they've been in the industry. or There's a thousand questions that you can ask that all of a sudden feed your thinking as to what the artifact of a presentation, what problem it's intended to solve for the people who show up.
most of the time, when you are bored, it means the person who's speaking, and if you're bored right now, this applies to me as well, it means the person who's speaking did not think carefully enough, or possibly not even at all, about why you're here. Don't ever let that happen to you. If you're thinking clearly about why people are there, even if you don't like public speaking, even if you don't think of yourself as charismatic, even if you talk into your shoes, if you're talking about stuff people really care about, they will pay attention. You know, a simple trick is uh, to think about, um, people talk all the time about uh, you know, how to keep people's attention as if there's some gimmick to it. But if I were, if this lecture, if I were to switch gears and say what this lecture is really about was uh, I'm going to give away $500 million at the end of this lecture. And I'm going to talk for the next 20 minutes about how I'm going to choose who gets the money. All of a sudden, it's interesting. No matter what superficial things as a speaker, I'm not doing well. On the other end of the spectrum, you could have Tony Robbins or Barack Obama or some great charismatic speaker. And if you asked him to speak for 20 minutes about who's going to help with his taxes or something, your interest level would drop. So a lot of the whole game is matching the stuff that you think you're supposed to share, you have that's valuable to the people who are there and make sure that's a, that that's, that Venn diagram is a rich Venn diagram, that you're covering, you're covering both stuff that make it interesting to you, but also make it interesting to them. So instead of being the kind of guy who has, tells these long-winded stories and is comprehensive, you've thought about it carefully, you've at least found a way to make it interesting to yourself, maximally you've found a way to think about why people are there, and you're solving those problems for them. We're on the home stretch now. I only have two more of these. So if you're thinking, man, he still hasn't talked about my thing, Keep it in mind, because we'll have Q&A in about 10 minutes, maybe 8 minutes, 7 minutes, 5 minutes, soon. <laughs> so this point is, has to do with being smart. And you guys are all smart. A lot of smart people out there. Smart people often make a smart person's mistake when it comes to presenting and pitching. Because there's this, there's this habit that many smart people have of uh, when you're in an argument and you start to lose, you increase the syllable count per word, like the vocabulary complexity goes up, and you're betting that at some point you'll use a word that the other person doesn't understand, and since you're in an argument, they're not going to say, I don't know what that means, they're just going to back out of the argument, and you're going to win by like technical knockout, that you've now <laughs> done this, oh, okay, you win, you're like, yes. Does not actually mean your argument was sound, it means you used kind of a technicality, a word they didn't know to win. So this habit is a defensive way to communicate. You are actually, literally, you're trying to push people away. And any time I see someone use a lot of jargon, I see, anytime I see someone use the, making choices where they are picking complex words rather than simple, even though a simple one is probably just as good, they are saying, back off. I, I am pushing you away. I really don't want you to understand. I don't really want you to follow along on my path. I'm pushing you away. That's a response many smart people have when, when they're up here because you we feel vulnerable up here. We feel like we're going to be attacked. We want to push people away. The goal instead, though, of having, allowing rhetoric to be the, um, allowing rhetoric to be the flaw is to think again about what the whole purpose of all of this is. If you're actually speaking about something you care about, then you want people to follow along. If you have an idea you're trying to convince someone to adopt or give you money for or support in some way, you want them to be on your side. So this approach of, being complex first is never going to work. Instead, you have to be thinking the opposite way. What's the simplest way I can explain what it is my purpose is? I'm trying to make the world better. Well, how? What, whatever the high-level goal is, you have to make sure that becomes clear first and enthusiastically. And then you follow up with your things that are more complex and more advanced, assuming people can follow along with you. And I studied philosophy in, in college, and there's this thing about rhetoric that uh, is very important when it comes to speaking. And it has to do with the difference between points and arguments. Points and arguments. A point is the message, the five things you want people to leave with, or the, the actions you want them to take. That's the point of what you're doing. Whether that's a pitch, whether that's an idea pitch, whether that's a, uh, a, you know, a status meeting, there's, there's a set of things you want to make clear. And those have to be crystal clear. There should never be someone who leaves listening to you and is not clear on what your points were which is separate from the arguments for those points. The arguments that support the points, okay, maybe people won't agree with those, will be confused by them, they didn't fully understand my rationale, but they should never understand the purpose that I was trying to get across. So points and arguments. And many times, when you're in a bad lecture, a bad presentation, 
They've never figured out, the speaker has never thought through enough to clarify what the points are and what the arguments were. Instead, it's just this, 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 you know, this blob of facts and stories and data that doesn't make any sense. Coherence comes largely from before you sit down and make a slide, writing down what the things are you want people to leave with. The five things they should learn, the five new ideas they should have, the five questions they should now be prepared to answer. If you don't know what those five things are, then there's almost no chance that anyone's going to leave with anything at all. So points and arguments. Make sure your points are clear. And I highly recommend not starting in PowerPoint or Keynote when you start a talk. Because that will largely get you on the track of putting this stuff in, because it's fun to do. It makes you feel like you're making progress quickly. But you really have not thought at all about your audience. You have not thought at all about the things you want them to leave with. That requires your brain. No software tool can really do that for you. Speaking of, of software and slides, I'm not a huge believer in slides being the problem. If we're almost, we're almost done here. If you do the four or five things I've talked about already, then by the time you get to making slides, most of your problems that people create with slides will go away. But I have to talk about it at least for a minute. So this is a very typical kind of slide. This is a, you know, a uh, generic template you can find in almost any presentation tool with a bulleted list and a title at the top. And there are all these rules you might have heard about like uh, how to do these well, seven by seven. Has anyone heard of the seven by seven rule? There's a rule for this that you're supposed to, if ever you have bullets, you should have, uh, this is my you know, bad advice voice. If ever you have a bulleted slide, you should have seven bullets and never more than seven words per bullet. Sounds like, OK, now, this, now who made this up? Like, what, what research did they do on this? Like, no idea, because there probably isn't any. When I see a slide like this, I'm always, an, especially when someone asks me to look at their slide deck, like before they're going to give a talk, I know right off the bat this is someone who is, has made a bunch of the mistakes we've talked about already. First, it probably means they didn't practice. They don't know what they're going to say. So they've listed a whole bunch of stuff in the hopes that one of those things will make sense when they're up here speaking. Second, if they haven't practiced, it increases the odds when there's this much of density on the screen, they're going to do this. And they're going to turn and talk to their slides. Because there's almost a conversation, so much language here, they're going to end up having a conversation with their slides. And turning your back on your audience is a whole bunch of very bad things. I mean, in some countries, when you do this, it, you will get killed for this. It's like not <laughs> appropriate to do. And it also, any energy or enthusiasm theatrically should be directed at the audience. Well, as soon as you turn, even if you're just going back and forth, it diffuses your energy, which is a bad thing to do. The other problem with this kind of stuff, bulleted lists tend to feel, tend to make speakers feel like they are obligated to speak to everything on there. So it becomes comprehensive again. Now there's all the stuff that I feel like I gotta say this and then I gotta say that, which is boring and repetitive, and you're unlikely to be enthusiastic about it. So when you have this much visual density in terms of language, there's a lot of stuff here, usually means they didn't practice, did not think what their points were, right off the bat. The other end of visual density has to do with actual visual graphic design stuff. So this is another slide. This is an actual slide from the Department of Defense, and it's a, a report on the Iraqi war from a couple years ago. And when I see this slide, without knowing the speaker, without knowing anything about it, I also can make another set of assumptions, which again are similar to the first one does not know what he's going to say when this is up. There's so much data here, visually and dimensionally. I mean, he's got, he's got you know, orange squares and red squares and like gradient squares. And there's like this huge tree of the complexity of stuff here. You could talk for hours about the data represented here, which is not what you want to do when you're talking. That's bad. That means not clear. And if I had to make a whole bunch of assumptions even further, the goal of this meeting to show stuff like this is probably of the nature of, How's it going? Is it going well? OK, what are the five things that are going well? What are the five things that are not? What are the dimensions of those things? And that's a simple question. It's an important question, but it's a simple question. This, don't know what the question is. Therefore, you don't know what the answer is. Therefore, I can guess the guy spent a whole ton of time playing around with PowerPoint, getting really excited at how much detail he put in there without ever thinking about his audience or what he was going to say or what he wanted them to leave with. So the goal for all the slide stuff, really, instead of having confused slides or distracting slides, slides are a prop. They're in support of whatever it is that you're saying. If you need a bulleted list that actually supports you, great. I've had bulleted lists in the slide deck already. I'm not saying never use bulleted lists. But you have to make sure they are in service of a higher purpose. The audience's purpose, your purpose, and the point you're trying to make, and never allow them to be the focal point. 
When you start out in PowerPoint and you spend hours in there, you're going to tend to want to talk about your work because it's your thing you're proud of. You want to show it off. No one really is going to care. It came for reasons they care about that have nothing to do with your ability to make slides or not. So those are the six reasons for badness, for evil, to be less, uh, less sarcastic or cynical. Flip these over, and uh, these are the positive things that I hope that you'll think about next time you give a talk. First, just to summarize right off the bat, the amygdala, you are going to be afraid. Everyone is. You can't turn that off. You have to control the things you can. At a minimum, help your body out, get some exercise that morning. By far, that will make a radical difference. You're helping your body deal with the physiological fears involved in speaking. Second, practice. This is a performance. Whether you're pitching or giving a talk in a small group, you have some idea you're trying to convey, there are performance aspects to having arguments, even in the small. If you don't practice it, then you're making them the guinea pig. And if you care about your ideas, it's a stupid thing to do. You want to do a dry run. You want to run it by people, get their feedback on your pitch, how to make it sharper or tighter. Obvious, easy thing to do. No technology required. Fourth, about being interesting. Emotion counts. Enthusiasm counts. It's up to you to find a way to make it interesting yourself when you open your mouth. You could have the best idea in the world. If you seem bored by it, we know from the psychology, from the cognitive psychology data that we have, likelihood of people believing you and following your idea goes down. And then lastly, anything you use or show, slides, demos, whatever it is that you feel obligated to show, Make sure it really supports the points, and make sure it supports the reasons why people came. The slides should be a prop in support of whatever it is that you're doing.